and welcome to the podcast of The Living Harmony. My name is Manuela Ulram. I'm a shamanic coach and the founder of The Living Harmony. Today, I have my wonderful guest here and friend, Nick Alvear, directly from Nashville. Hello, Nick. Welcome to my podcast. It's a great honor to have you here. Thanks for your time. How are you doing? Hey, hey, thanks for having me on. I'm doing good. Life is great. Life has been really wild. I mean, life inside my body feels good. Life outside in the world looks crazy. Um, <laughs> but I'm doing my best to stay, you know, zen and calm and healthy and also writing my next film. So, yeah. And it's kind of like I just made a really, really big film. And sometimes, like, I've never really done that before. So now writing our second one, I'm like, it should, this, this doesn't feel like anything different. But it's also, I don't think it's going to be as big as the last one, you know? So it's just kind of an interesting thing to experience, you know? Yes, and I forgot to mention, Nick is a film producer, musician, father, and we want to talk about about your latest film who hit 1 million views or even more. Yeah. And what was the film called? The Greatest Show on Earth. It has about a million. Well, I mean, if you really count it all, on my page it has 1.1 1. 1 million. But then there's another. There's so many other pages that live stream the film that have total about 2 million so it has 3 million, maybe more on Rumble alone. Wow. Then there, there's my website, which it has a million views on. And then today they just released actually a version in Swedish. <gasps> yeah. Uh-huh. Wow. I know. I know. We had a really cool two groups, uh, a group of ladies. They uh, transcribed the whole English and, and then they voiced over it. So it's not even like subtitles. It's like totally voiced over. I know. And there, she has a good channel on YouTube. I forgot to tell you that. <laughs> I know. Fantastic. You should get a German version. We would love to have a German version. You can reach 100 million people in the German speaking area. I know. and Absolutely. If there's someone out there who does German, that would be fantastic. Um, because now my operation is... Like I got my mom doing the Spanish. She's doing Spanish voiceovers. And then it would be cool if these ladies do the next one in in Swedish. And then if I could have like five languages that we could release these movies in, it would hit the whole world. Yeah. Oh my God. This is amazing. Yeah, we should get a German version. This would be fantastic. You speak German? Of course, in Switzerland we speak German. You're hired. You just walk yeah, in as a trap. I got a job. <laughs> actually, actually, you really could if you want to. <laughs> I would love to do. Um, yeah, you got a great voice. It would work. Yeah, it's easy. I would love to do that. I mean, I say it's easy. It's actually kind of hard, but like the yeah, we'll, we'll go into that later. <laughs> okay, we take it offline. <laughs> My new job hire. <laughs> So what was your your biggest like challenge to do the movie? The last one? Biggest, cha biggest challenge is always in the beginning because it's before the movie's made. You got to see the movie on paper. So writing the script. And the biggest challenge was when I realized what I was going to do, I was going to take this really awesome truther named Derek Johnson who does so much research. I was thinking, man, this guy's so smart and speaks so fast. People get it but they don't really grasp what he's saying fully because he's so fast and sometimes he's a little funky. So my challenge was how do I get what he says condensed enough to where people can understand it in a movie? That was the biggest challenge. So like I watched his videos 50 to a hundred times over and over and I wrote everything he was saying while I listened to it. And that was the biggest challenge I'd say. Editing too is really challenging, but that's kind of fun. But trying to stay awake while you're so tired, while I'm so tired editing, that was a challenge. And then the, the devil always comes in one form or another while you're doing something of importance. 
And uh, this time it was an old employee who was being a butthead. And uh, he used to work for me and then he wasn't working for me. And then he hates Trump. So it was in his nature to be a big butthead. And he just tried to make things difficult for me. And it actually worked for me. Most of the time, the thing that we think is working against us is actually there to help us. So he has no idea, but his childish behaviors made me realize the best revenge is success. So it made me want to try even better to make the coolest movie ever. And it really turned out to be the, my best movie ever. That's uh, for sure. This has been my best movie ever. You can just see in all the comments what people have said. They've been crying. They've been sharing it with all their family, waking up their family members. Also, um, watching it three or four times. Like, it's pretty cool. Yeah, we watched it like twice. <laughs> it was amazing. We loved your film. And Tight. yeah, it's amazing. You know, we're, you're sitting in Switzerland and then you're watching Good Lion on your screen in the living room. And like, oh, we know Nick. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. You're a you're an executive producer for anyone who doesn't know that Manuela and her husband have been producing a lot of my films. But you'll see them in the beginning of a lot, including this next one. So this I'm excited for this next one. But this is the first time I'm, I've allowed myself to just relax a little bit because mm -hmm. I've made 57 films in three years. I've gone to jail twice for January 6th. Um, and I've lived in like eight different places. So now I finally have a place where I'm living at for at least a year and I'm enjoying it. I haven't been able to enjoy my life like I am right now. And it's cool because I'm studying film. I just in unique ways. Like I print out screenplays and I read them, then I watch the film and then I learn about the filmmaker because that's where I'm headed. I mean, I make films now, but they're documentaries, but eventually I'll be making movies, movies, and that's going to be a whole nother chapter. So I'm like, I'm 35 right now. And I'm probably going to be making movies, movies till I'm 65 or 70. So that's probably seven or 10 movies that I have in me. I can make if I do one every five or four years. And now I'm starting to think, what are those going to be? Because I know so much. I've done so many red pill documentaries that I know what they don't want us to know. And I'm not just going to make a movie about nothing. So I'm really taking time into thinking, what's going to be the, the thing I leave behind for the future generations to watch and go, oh, I understand. That guy did know a lot. Mm -hmm. that's my mm -hmm. mission right now oh this is amazing so how did this all movie filmmaking how did how did it all start did you wake up one morning and then you said i will make movies or was it like process in your childhood or how did it all yeah, start it started, it started in childhood pretty much might have it might have started when i just was given the task to come to to this planet and do what i had to do it feels like it's a like a mission from above, but mm -hmm. because I was born into a family where my mom was a musician and my dad is a photographer, so I grew up with these two creatives and then boredom. Just being a young kid and being bored led me to take advantage of what was around me. So I had a camcorder and I, I would watch movies as a kid and I, I guess I must have been really inspired as a kid. Because then I would start making movies with my mom's camcorder. And then somehow my mom brought home, well, my mom was a technology teacher. So she would um, come home with the coolest technology. So like one of them was a PC that had a VCR input in the back. So I thought, oh, so I can film on this camcorder, put it in the VHS cassette, put it, um, put that in the VCR and capture it on the computer. That means I could start editing. So when I was a young kid, I started editing mainly because the stuff was around. Like I didn't have to ask my mom, like, can we buy this so I could edit? It was just there. So at a young age, I was editing, making cool animations to where my parents were like, whoa, what is he doing? I just, <laughs> I've always been doing that. Like I was even doing stop motion before I started filming where I'd take a picture, move something a little bit, 
take another picture, move it a little bit and do an animation. I was doing that a lot as a kid. And then <clears throat> I went to a technology high school where we, it was the first technology uh, high school where I grew up, where we all used computers. That was like a big thing at this time. And this was 2002. And, um, and getting into that school was big because if I had gone to any other school, they probably wouldn't have seen me as potential. And this school saw the potential in me and I, and I took all the classes I needed to, to get better at making movies. And, um, but what I think watching zeitgeist in 2008, I graduated high school two years later, I see this documentary that makes me realize, wait a second, you're telling me everything that they taught me in school was a lie. Um, that I think started the path to what led to this version of the filmmaker, Nick, was that um, I was never political. I was just a spiritual person. I would just meditate and play in bands and, and I didn't want to go to school and I didn't want to make money or anything. Mm -hmm. But then I started looking around and I see, I'm seeing people are graduating with master's degrees and I got nothing. And I'm like, oh, I need to make something of myself. I can't just meditate for the rest of my life. <laughs> and uh, I know I was that die hard. It was pretty, it's very weird to look back on it, but I understand it. And then uh, I went to school and I, I, I was going to go for film and psychology. I wanted to be a psychologist. And, and then I figured, well, I do want to make movies. So I, the only class I could take because I joined too late was documentary filmmaking. And I thought, ah, oh, well, at least it's something. At least it's something. So I took that class, and then uh, the guy was a was a BBC documentary uh, maker, the teacher, and he was kind of a dick. He was kind of a jerk, and uh, and uh, I remember playing my documentary, which was how my parents met, and I had a good time doing it. But I never thought I'd be making documentaries like this, and um, then life unraveled a little bit, and I became more political i dated a woman who was political and then that's what kind of started it she was a she was really into politics and i wasn't but that kind of started it and then i fell in love with trump and then crazy how it all unraveled the way it did but my biggest failure at the time became my biggest success and that was getting fired went to school to become a network engineer because eventually I realized being a psychologist and doing filmmaking, I don't even know if I can make money doing those. Those are the thoughts of a brainwashed, indoctrinated school kid. Um, so I was like, let's just become a network engineer. I tried really hard and I got certifications, learned how the internet worked, and then uh, got a couple good jobs. And then I was too loud about liking Trump. I got fired. So for one person, that could be the end of their life. Oh, I got fired. I was mm -hmm. always getting fired. But um, it was the beginning because then I started to make documentaries three months after I got fired. Actually, it was one month after I got fired. Uh, I released my first documentary and I haven't stopped making documentaries since, through my whole life since. So it's quite an interesting story along the, it's like, a, it's like I was made for this time and mm -hmm. everything I was doing before was just getting me ready for what I'm doing now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love your story. And I consider myself your biggest fan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and cool. isn't that amazing how the universe always works for us and not against us? We just need some time to to realize it. But, you know, all your, your, your journey has been so incredible. And, you know, thanks to being fired. We, we can now, the whole world can watch your movies. Imagine you wouldn't been fired. You would still work in this company. I know. And I remember almost having thoughts of like a future me going, hey, man, like, I don't think you're going to make it doing this thing. You're like, you really need to start doing what you're supposed to do. It's like I always knew. And it's like people always around me knew too they could just tell, like, I remember not the boss who fired me, but the one before he was like, you're way too talented, man. I don't know why you're working here. And I'm like, but you've never seen anything I've made. Like, how do you know that? Like they could just tell by the way I presented myself and how I talked about my dreams. 
And so these are clues for like, if someone wants to make something out of their life that it seems like they can't make it happen now, it's all about how you think, because then you're going to act a certain way. Then you're going to develop behaviors that lead to habits. And then you're going to be that person before. And then that's where the creations come from when you already are that person. So you don't have to have things to be that person. You just have to create the right attitude and thoughts because some people can't do it. They're too afraid. But mm -hmm. yeah, it's, I wouldn't be making movies if I didn't get fired. Everything mm -hmm. that happened along the way, like I almost died in a car accident. No, I didn't get hurt. Nobody got hurt. It was just me um, almost driving off a cliff like an idiot. And um, mm -hmm. that, that was a weird moment. But if that didn't happen, none of this would, would be happening. So like every, like the times I've been in jail, I, I tell people even in a mess, I'm blessed. You know, like, doesn't matter what's going on. If you got the right lens on, it's going to be serving you, not against you. So if something ha happens to you that's shitty and you go, oh, I hate you, you know, uh, God, why would you do this to me? You mm -hmm. might actually need to turn that around and say, well, I don't hate you, but why would you do this to me? And then start mm -hmm. looking into it and seeing how it's for you, not against you. Because it's usually yeah. for us. Always, even though, yeah, for me also, sometimes when some things um, do not work out as I want to work them out. So, but I always tell myself the universe, universe works for me. And like a couple of weeks or months later or years, yeah, I didn't realize it. Okay. Sometimes it's, it's not such a long term. <laughs> uh, I know, right? It takes time. I remember I went to Tony Robbins in, in 2015 and I didn't even, I think I, dang, I don't even know if I had my daughter then might've been just before, but uh, I, you, you had to like list down your dreams of what you wanted to accomplish in the next five years. Going to something like that is great because you learn a lot of tools. You get a lot of the ideas that are in your head out onto paper when the daily life might actually be so busy that you can't. And that I recommend to some people, something big, something where you can change the way you think, because sometimes you might know you need to change the way you think, but you might not have the right tools. You might not have the right experience. That's why like, um, you know, like magic mushrooms sometimes can be good for people. It helps them get out of their pattern of patterns of thinking. That's why they can give that to alcoholics or any drug addicts. They can give them a trip with magic mushrooms in the jungle with a guide. It helps them reset their mind. I don't know if there's anybody out there struggling, wanting to make something of themselves and they don't feel like they are something. You already have all the answers in you. You just got to quiet down enough to find it and then grow enough courage to go pursue it relentlessly yeah now how did you find the your strengths to always believe in yourself or the were there times when you thought oh my god nobody wants to watch my movies you know were you like doubting yourself or um do you have experience like like that yeah like the first movie i saw that made me go i can do this way better um, was Fall of the Cabal, which is a great documentary series. But I remember thinking, dang, people really love this documentary series, but like the, the visuals are crappy <laughs> and the audio was quality is poor. It, but, it, but the woman who's speaking it has this authority and she's just awesome. And her script is great. So I thought I could do, the, I could do a great script and I, I can sound good. I'm like, but I can make it look great. So I, it's just perfect timing. But what, after my first one, I put it on Twitter everywhere I could. It was on YouTube and I just shared it on Twitter everywhere. And I remember after a week, it had 3,000 views. And I was like, I wasn't really bummed. I was like, all right, people are watching it. I was like, this is cool. And then I made a second one and then I started doing the same thing. I put it all over Twitter. And one time this guy with like 30,000 followers, he's like, this is cool. I'm going to share it. I was like, oh, so then after a week, it had like 7,000 views. Wow. And that was the second movie. And I was like, cool. 
And then the third one, like bigger people started to share it. And then that one, I remember that one got like 20,000 views. So I was like, it's working. Whatever I'm doing is working. But every single time I made a movie, I thought, oh, people aren't going to like this. There's always a period of time in making something of creation where you will doubt yourself. Mm-hmm. And that's what I realized after making so many. It's like, oh, I'm always going to doubt myself at some point in the movie. Even with this last movie, which is super big, at the end, I was embarrassed. I was like, this is cheesy. Oh, gosh. So I I sent it to you. I sent it to my friends. And I was like, can you guys watch this? And I was like, please like it. So like even with me, it happens with every every movie. I'm going to feel the same emotions. I'm going to feel like it's the best movie ever. Oh, this is so terrible. People are going to hate it. It's just a common thing. Once you realize Mm -hmm. it's common, you learn to ignore it. And you just keep going while you're making the movie. And, And so, yeah, in the beginning, it was cool because... I did my fourth film and I think it might've gotten like 30,000. It kept growing. And then I went to a wow. site and she was like, Hey, you need to write your own movie instead of getting movies from other people who are doing Twitter threads. And I would ask people if I could use their Twitter threads to make movies and they'd say, yes. So I was like, okay, I'll make my own. I'll write my own. Crazy that she said that she knew exactly what I needed. And so I, I wrote what was burning on in my head and it was those who yell the loudest have the most to hide. And it was basically about people who hate Trump. They hate Trump so much. But then I was like, why don't I look into their closet and see what what they've got hiding in there? And the first episode was about Kathy Griffin and how she hates Trump. But really, she might actually be a man. She might be Carter. uh, She might be Carter Cooper, which is Anderson Cooper's brother, who was sacrificed at a young age because their mother, Gloria Vanderbilt, super famous and rich is actually used to be the satanic priestess, um, I think, of Hollywood. And it makes sense when you look at it. So I put that in the movie. I put Howard Stern in the movie because he was very vocal about hating Trump. But he called Trump a creep, a pervert. But then if you watch some Howard Stern, he is checking out the Olsen twins when they're 12 years old, saying he can't wait to bang them. He's like, I don't even care if they're not of age. Creep. That guy's a creep. So – I had so much pent up energy in me, like, oh, all these people who hate Trump are actually the weirdos. And just before I released that movie, I saw an image in Google Images or DuckDuckGo, and it said Purviewood on a mountain. And someone made this thing called Purviewood. It wasn't a movie. It was just they replaced Hollywood sign with Purviewood. And I thought, that's a way better title because those of y'all the loudest have the most to hide way too long. So I, I was like, I'm calling it Purviewood. And that became huge. Like that one, that number one was actually, that one got like 50,000 views. And I was like, oh my God. And then the second one I made, that that's the one that went crazy. That was with, with uh, Michelle Obama and Steven Spielberg. And that got like 200,000 views in the first week, which made all the other movies I made get way more views. And then before I knew it, in like two or three weeks, it had 500,000 views. And I was like, wow. And everyone was commenting like crazy. And I think on the second one, it what happened was, what is it, the second one? They took it down. And uh, I wrote something to all my followers because on YouTube, I grew a lot of followers. I said, email me if you want the, just the link to watch it. And I got so many emails that night. My I was with my ex-wife at the time. And I was up all night answering all of these emails. Here you go. Here you go. And I was like, this is crazy. It was like the beginning of what was to come. But now I've, I've made 16 pervy woods. And I'm, I think I'm done making pervy woods. I don't like calling people out anymore. And, and everyone knows that there's a bunch of people that are dark and corrupt and Satanist. It's dark energy making that kind of stuff. So I think I retired from pervy wood. The last one was Madonna, and uh, I've done – eventually the Pervy Woods took on a solo individual flavor. So, like, in the beginning it used to be, like, two or, or, or two or three people, and then I started doing, like, Washington, D.C., and then I'd do um, – then I started taking it individually. So there's a Stephen Colbert Pervy Wood. There's a Mother Teresa Pervy Wood. There's um, uh, Alec Baldwin, and then there's Madonna. There's Oprah. I even did one on Elon Musk, but 
I think he's different now. All right. I think he's good. Yeah, it's it's been crazy. I this been nuts. I can't believe I'm actually where I'm at. Like I didn't think I was gonna get this far doing it. It's just crazy. Yeah. Yeah, and for anyone out there, um, I highly recommend watch Perry Wood. It will blow your mind. It's absolutely fabulous, fabulous documentaries, and you can learn a lot from Nick. Yeah, so with, thank you. With, with all these movies, I assume you don't have only friends, so you probably have a lot of haters or hate comments. I had I had yeah. hate comments this week. I brought out my videos, they are free on my website about the 12 magic nights. And I get my first hate comments. Yeah. Uh, your, your first one. Woohoo. That's big. What they say? Um, the first one, it was on Facebook was because I do a Facebook campaign. They said I do um it was in German. I do like um Aldi, you know Aldi, the low, the cheap supermarket. Do you have Aldi in, oh, in the US? Yeah, I've heard of this Aldi, yeah. I don't Aldi know if you got them here, but they even have one in Florida. They said I I do Aldi oh, esoteric for dummies. Uh, okay. <laughs> and yeah. the other one was like, oh, I am like, I think I'm something better. <laughs> I just bring out free things you know on magic and how to empower yourself and free healing and people are yeah. like dunk, 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 dunk. <laughs> but i have to yeah. learn how to how do you handle this can you give me or the audience advice how to handle hate comments yeah. you have experience I remember the, yeah i remember the first hate comment i started getting and i was like dang that's weird like because i never realized it's crazy on the internet people are going to hate you no matter what they don't even know you they're going to hate you and you're like whoa this is crazy but the first one I got was, why does he talk like that? Why does he sound like that? And I was like, well, sound like what? This is just me talking, dude. But like, uh, people were like weirded out because when I used to do for my first movies, I'd have to do it when my daughter went to sleep. So I'd go up and I'd have to record it. And I was recording so she wouldn't wake up. So I was like talking like this. And then it was like intimate, you know, and people were like, ew. But actually a lot of people were like, he sounds sexy. So like, it didn't bother me that some people didn't like it because I realized there were a lot of people that did like it. But that was a big lesson right away was that it doesn't matter what you make, there's going to be an audience for you. There's going to be people who love it and there's going to be people who hate it. It doesn't matter what it is. That's why everyone needs to make art because there's always going to be someone out there who loves it and there's always going to be someone who hates it. So some people are really mean. I mean, I started doing a lot of podcasts and I'd see way more mean people. How to deal with it is just realizing that uh, there's there's people that are, are just very unhappy in the world and those people have the internet and they take it out on people. So like uh, on my website with the chat support, we recently started getting like hundreds of thousands of visitors to the website when before there was maybe a couple thousand. So we weren't ready to like to support the people who don't know how to use the internet really well. Cause that's basically mm -hmm. what it is with our support. It's like people who don't know how to use the internet well, really need a lot of help. And those are usually the older generations. No offense mm -hmm. to anybody. It yeah. just, they didn't have much experience. So a lot of them would get angry at, and I'd see it there the most. I'd be like, dang, why are you yelling at me? Like, you know, you haven't even said anything and you're already yelling. So people have a relationship with the internet and support and chats and comments. They have a relationship where they can take it out on them because there's no face to it. Mm -hmm. I'll remind people like, Hey man, I'm a face, you know, I'm, I'm actually Nick, the maker of the website. I'm here right now. You're talking to me. And they'll be like, Oh my God, I'm so sorry. And I'm like, yeah, man, what's your problem? Why are you so angry? So realizing that people are just angry and what they're saying is probably coming out of their butt. That helps me deal with it. But I still get a little upset seeing where people are at. Like, how can people be so inhumane? And just try and make fun of it. Because you're awesome. You're needed for what people need. So there's people at different stages of their learning. There's some people who don't know anything about Pervywood. And then there's people who know all of it. 
So like in the same way with your, with, with your teachings, there's some people who know all of it and some people who don't know anything. So mm -hmm. you're there for each individual layer. I'm sure you could do an advanced course, but right now you're doing the wise thing. You're like introducing people into it, growing people into it. Like that's the only way. So yeah, Yeah. it's pretty nuts, man. Yeah, I know it, it's really crazy. And then I thought, okay, um, I was like, okay, I do like um, a free, um, free videos. They're ten minutes each, and it's all about the magic nights between Christmas New Year. Um, it's it's just my my strategy with the candles, with the wishes, and smudging, and you know, my rituals. Just want to share. But so nobody has to really watch it. They can just swipe it and <laughs> delete my videos. <laughs> they comment yeah. it. So it was so I had to learn this week how to deal with hate comments. But as you said, it's probably like um, I don't know, we're two ladies older than me. No offense, but <laughs> but it was oh, like yeah. <laughs> but it was like um interesting to get my first hate comments. Two older ladies. You know, I mean, then you got to realize like the percentage of people in the world that are on some kind of pharmaceutical medication that makes them unhinged emotionally is probably a lot. And then also jealousy is another thing. Once you start putting yourself out there a lot, you're going to get a lot of jealous people. Sometimes people don't even know they're jealous. Sometimes mm -hmm. people experience it as hate. They'll hate something that they like because they wish they could do it or be it. So, uh, That's the thing about the internet world. A lot of people are like, dang, that person's getting attention. Oh, I wish I had the balls to do it. And then they'll hate. I've seen it happen all the time. Like, all the time. I'm used to it now. There's a lot of haters out there. There's a lot of lovers, too. But there's so mm -hmm. many sad haters out there. It's mm -hmm. crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's set them love and light and prosperity to the haters. <laughs> yeah. The other day, there was a guy inside my Telegram chat who was, uh, I came in there and I saw he was kind of angry at everybody. And he was saying some mean things. And then he was like, kick me out of here, Nick. Boot me out. And I was like, why am I going to boot you out, man? I could just tell you're hurt. What's your problem? Like, what are you mad about? What are you hurting about, dude? Like, only hurt people hurt people. And he was like, I've been a truther since the 70s, man. I've been awake for a long time. And there's some dumb people in here. I'm like, look, dude, I understand. I would be pissed off too if I was awake for that long and not seeing any change. So I feel you. So I related to him. So he felt heard. And then I said, but look it, man, you might be where you're at, but it's kind of like, think about children. Are you going to be mad at a child because, you know, they know addition, but they don't know multi multiplication? Are you going to yell at them because they don't know how to do math? And he's like, all right, I get it. I get it. I'm like, yeah, you got to be patient with people, man. If you're at a certain place, don't get mad at other people for being at a different grade. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, then he felt heard, understood. And then he said, sorry. And then I'm like, see, well, like, this is way better. Like, I could have just kicked you out. And then you would have been an angry SOB to wherever you went, you know, for the next couple of days, maybe even more. But instead I was like, dude, let's love is also being a questioner of someone's behavior You're like love isn't just oh i love you love you dubby love is caring attention and attention might feel icky sometimes so when i was dealing with him it was kind of uncomfortable but i and i even teased him too like i like in the process before he opened up i'm like bro you can't be about god and being like treating people like this come on man you need to go talk to your god right now and see if he feels what you're saying is accurate Like in the process, it was kind of fun. And then he ended up opening up his heart. So it's like, we could do that more with other people and then have less hurt people in the world. We'd have less bullies. Mm. But what kind of advice would you give? Would you go like react to some hating comments or would you just ignore them? Like in my case, I get these two ladies who... Ignore them. <laughs> yes, I did. But... Sometimes, though, like I like to have fun with it and it, just, it, just, it depends on my mood, but there's it depends on depends on my mood. Sometimes I like to mess with people back, you know, <laughs> yeah. I like to give them the energy that they're giving me 
And, um, but for the most part, when there becomes so much, I just ignore them. Like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's all you can do. Yeah. With those people, I mean, you could be like, you understand it. So you're taking the higher ground. But if, whenever it gets to be too much, I say go for it. Kind of get them a little bit, grab Maybe. at the back, <laughs> wake them up a bit. Be like, why are you so bothered? Why are you so bothered that I'm actually doing what I would like to do in life? Is it that you're not? Like asking questions like that might make them realize like, oh, wait, oh, shit. Maybe I am being an asshole. Like, <laughs> yeah. that, that, that's how I've done it with some people. And then they'll come back around. They'll be like, you're right. I was being mean. I'm sorry. I'm like, this is cool. Like, And I wasn't being really nice when I said it. I was being straightforward, stern, like, hey. Why are you treating me like a, like an asshole? Like this is the internet. I'm a human, mm -hmm. and then it wakes people up. People are in their crazy, angry state. The world is not a great place, and if people don't have the tools, like the tools that you're teaching, people are just gonna be like spam emotion. <clears throat> they're gonna be junk mail of emotions. They don't even know what they're feeling. They don't have any control over it, and they're just spamming everyone with their pollution of emotion which is not cool. We got a responsibility being human. And most mm -hmm. people gave up on that. They just go get up, go to work, pay up, pay their bills, go to sleep, drink, whatever. And they don't really care or realize that, that there's a responsibility in being a human. That's what you're teaching. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. And uh, what, what did you ask you um, about our project? Shall we say something? Oh, that's a great idea. The, the shamanic yes. healing. Shamanic healing. Speaking of which, that's a perfect leeway. Um, Manuel has been doing a full-on course on the basics and more on shamanic healing. And so we'll be launching that. By the time you see this, it might be launched already because it's 11-11 is the date we want to launch it. And um, it'll be on goodlion.tv for you guys to sign up. There's a few free courses. Then if you dig it, you can pay for it. And then you can course study yourself through the whole, the whole video um, course. So there's a, how many courses are there? Eight? Seven chapters. And with each chapters, there is a script. There is um, a, the a first, video. The first um, video, there is like a, a test and um, like about the energy vampires, how to identify energy vampires. And you get all the script for each chapter. And the What's script pretty cool is about, too. Oh, the script is about what? Um, about 10 pages for each chapter, 10 to 15 pages, depends on the topics. Have you ever thought that you could now use this framework to write a book? No, but... It's pretty, it's pretty much already, yeah, it's pretty much already done. Like now that I think about it, you know, like you've pretty much already done the chapters and the writings. So it's pretty much easy to make that book and then you can have it on Amazon. Cause um, like what's pretty cool is like the last few movies I've made um, beyond the Trump one, the Tartarian empire films, a lot of that's like Russian based information. Not that Russia is producing it. But that Tartaria uh, has its history in Russia, in the continent of Russia, and then all throughout the world. And when you connect that to Russian shamanic healing, you are getting, in essence, what the Tartarians were about. They're not, they weren't anything remotely like what we are today as society. So when you start to inhabit the belief systems, the healing modalities that they had, You start to create yourself a higher vibration and frequency to where you can then manifest more things. That's basically what it is. It's like a computer. We're all computers. And if you've got a fast one, you can run fast programs. And now if you have a healthy computer where it's not all jammed up in the hard drive, you can write code quicker. Writing the code is basically like what you do cover manifestation in your course. Um, probably yes, yeah. Oh yes, manifestation is a big topic. Power of thoughts, aura, aura reading, chakra healing, remedies. Oh, yeah. You know all these herbs, and I yeah. know yeah, Russian shamanism. This is where it all comes from, and it 
aligns perfectly with your Tartarian movies. 100%. Yeah. That's cool. In the movie, I'm going to integrate it somehow to, to where people can get their eyes on this course when they go watch this movie. Maybe I can do like a trailer in the beginning or in the middle or at the end. But um, this is what we need more of. I remember taking a course similar to yours when I was probably 20, 21, 22. And it was, it was, it was called Psychic Horizons. That it was basically the essence of like learning your aura, learning how to ground, um, learn. It basically was teaching people how to strengthen their psychic skills because we're all born with them. It's nothing demonic. There's probably a lot of diehard Christians whose ears are bleeding because they're freaking out. Um, don't let these dogmas confuse you. And if you're a diehard Christian, you're probably not going to be interested in this course because this is just the way things go, how they go. Um, don't mean to offend anybody, but I've just been dealing with a lot of people who can't get to this area because of some dogma. They think the study of the stars is de demonic. That is sad. Before any technology, before fast food, before the TV and streaming technologies, what people did was study the, the sky, the stars. Before calendars existed, before hours were around, before clocks we knew what we knew because of the stars it is not mm -hmm. demonic. And if any kind of force out there tells you that it is, that's because they don't want you to see it. If you've been following good Lion TV and you've been watching my movies and all the other movies I have on my website, you realize eventually that the powers that be, they tell you something's evil. So you don't look into it. So this is something big. You need to realize there's so much guidance that I've had from learning the stars and, and the essence of shamanic Russian shamanic healing ties in very well with it. And a lot of uh, what Manuel has done for me, I'm sure that you could probably do it for others as a private, private consultant. Um, the planet code readings. Oh yeah. Using, using the stars is some of the wisest things you can do when you realize how it influences your daily life. Some people will be like, Oh, it's demonic. <laughs> Fine. You're going to be yeah. living in that with those bumpers your whole life. And you're going to realize that there have been tools that that could help you. <clears throat> so if all this resonates with you, check out Manuela's new course. It's going to be on goodline.tv on 11.11. See, we're using the stars to release yes. it on a good day. <laughs> <laughs> it stands for new beginnings. Oh, sweet. Yeah. 11.11 new beginnings. And we have a Mercury retrograde coming up soon that can, that, that'll last from 1120 in the pre shadow period to the post shadow period ending J January 20th. So in a retrograde, it's a good time to retreat and anything with re. So rediscover, relearn, remember, um, reeducate. And so it's a good time to, to begin a course like this. Cause then you get to, um, reinvest time into your own education into your own habits and you can when the retrogrades over communications better less delays happen you'll be sharper i i love retrogrades because whatever is not going on that needs to go on starts to happen mm -hmm. like that's why there's arguments that happen because if you had miscommunication for a while for the three or four months before they start to come to the surface and then you get it all out. And then it's like, okay, sweet. We can move forward. It's a good force for evolution. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. And, and all this ancient wisdom we have here, it's nothing with nothing to do with demonic, not at all. Yeah. It's not demonic. It's pretty wild. It's pretty wild. I've been learning, learning a lot from Jordan Maxwell recently. And now I'm going to put some of that into the end of this film that I'm writing only because my nature is to question everything and to make movies about it. And it just seems like when you start to question the church or the Bible, mm -hmm. people get mm -hmm. so offended. It's very similar to questioning earth and whether it's flat or not, people will get so offended. And really a lot of people, not all, but a lot of people are born into their religion. It depends on where you're born and who your parents are. You didn't get to choose it. You've been to you've been told it. It's very similar to Santa Claus and the story of Santa Claus, except your parents end up telling you he's fake, or a friend tells you he's fake. 
Um, religion in many ways is like that. You have no idea why you believe it, but and then when you find out Santa Claus is not real, you get upset, you get angry. So whoever tells you it, you probably hate. Mm-hmm. I hate you. No, it's not true. I'm gonna go ask my parents. He is fake, and then you start to cry. Oh, so at first you're angry, then you're you find out the it is true, and then you're like, oh, you sad. Sadly, I'm not saying religion. Religious people suck. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying they're stupid. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying you. we've all been brought up in a world where questioning things aren't allowed. So once you do start mm-hmm. to question things, you'll realize certain things. And doesn't mean that, you know, what you've been believing is wrong. Doesn't mean that religion can't make a happy person, a peaceful person. It's just analyzing the makeup of what something is. Questioning it figuring out what it actually is and why we were lied to <clears throat> because we've been lied about to about everything. Yeah. Why would they not lie to us about that? That's one of the okay. biggest things. Yes. And this is the hardest um, part to when you wake up in your awakening process. Yeah. To realize, Oh, oh something went wrong in this world. The world is not what they told us it is. It's so different, but anyway. Yeah, it is that's the biggest. What it is. That's why the Matrix. I don't know if Keanu Reeves actually said this, but this is what I heard. He said the Matrix is a documentary, and the Matrix is it, like a documentary because when you wake up and you realize that all the, all of this has been a, like a program, pretty much people have been programmed to believe what they what, what they believe. When you wake up out of that, then you are really. You're out of the matrix while still in it. And it's very hard to get there. And it's pretty easy to stay there once you're there. So, yeah, that's been my, I'm like Morpheus in the world. I'm just there trying to wake people up. I'm trying to find out who's the one, who's Neo. Maybe I'm Neo too. Maybe we're all Neo. Yeah. Uh, let's go back to the movies. Um. For the young generation, what kind of advice would you give to a new starter who wants to produce film, make documentaries? What would your advice would be to your younger Nick or to a mm. film, film academy student? To, to uh, I'd say to keep going, to keep practicing, to keep making stuff, to not worry about what other people are going to think about what you're making, because that'll make you stop what you're doing. A lot, I notice a lot of people slow down because they're overly critical about what they're doing. Um, it's about finding a sweet spot of critical. So have enough critical or criticism in your own work to where you are honest with what you're making is okay. <clears throat> so like, Don't let it suck. I know it sounds weird, but <laughs> have standards. Like, try and make your stuff look as good as what makes you go wow. And the internet is your best friend. You can always learn how to do something on there. The subtle art of becoming a good editor and filmmaker comes from doing it over and over and not being afraid to suck. You really have to understand that if you're going to get good at something, you're going to suck. Mm -hmm. And thankfully, I've been editing for a while to where I already sucked a long time ago. And and like to some people, I might still suck, but I don't <laughs> suck nearly as much as I used to. So it's like learning to ride a bike. You're It's going to be hard at first. Be okay with things being hard because you'll always get better. And that's what makes a really good – filmmaker they just keep going they learn and they're always trying to do better that's what i would recommend and uh really just don't pay attention to what other people are saying so much just make what you want to make and make it good like i look back at some of my films the first two and i'm like oh <laughs> why did i why did i do that <clears throat> but at the time i was like yeah this is awesome so then as time goes, you watch other movies and you go, that's how you do it. And then you put that in your quiver with all the other arrows of skills that you have amassed. And then you 
you aim every movie to make it better than the last one. Just so happened, this last movie just was a combination of really cool things that I've been wanting to put into a movie. And if you give yourself a goal, you're going to get the right guidance with it's like asking the right question brings the right answer. So for me, I was thinking, how do I really, how do I bring so much information to some, to people without making the head, their heads explode? Mm-hmm. And I found the right formula. I was like, oh yeah, make it a, a bunch of acts, make it seven or eight acts, show what you're going to show them first as topics. So they understand what they're going to be seeing. And then eventually it's going to be less of a confusion. Like the more you represent, you repeat information, the more people are going to remember it. So uh, yeah, eventually you just start learning as you go, but yeah, don't give up. I'd say that. And also don't care what other people, other people are going to think. And then don't be afraid to be risky and try new things and push yourself. Don't let that inner critic who tells you that it, you're you're bad or you suck don't let them survive train a new part of your brain that is the guy that's your best friend or girl in in the same room with you be crazy imagine that there's someone else with you who's like dude you're freaking awesome this is super cool create that person in your head so that you never give up because there have been times where i've seriously wanted to stop making movies and I'd be like, I'm over this. I'm done. I'm never making another movie ever again. I hate this. I've literally stopped this. And then I'll lay on the bed and I'll be like, I hate it. I hate doing this. And then something will be like, what are you thinking, you retard? Get up. You <laughs> love doing this, dude. You're crazy. Yeah. Like, you're good at this. And I'll be like, you're right. So I guess to some people that's crazy. But if you have that inner coach who won't let you give up on your dream, mm-hmm. You'll just you'll keep going. Oh, yeah. Wonderful said. So before we conclude our podcast, what are your future plans? My Any future plans. Movies? Your future. I'm gonna make the Tartarian Empire two remnant power that's already written, soon to be edited. I edit pretty fast, so my goal is to have it out. Ooh, probably come out by the end of the month, maybe maybe the first couple days of the December. But um, after that, oh, we're um, I'm starting a film festival based off of the last film I made. I did a premiere screening in Nashville and it was great. So people want us to do more of that. And so do I, it's been a goal of mine to have a film festival. So we're doing the Good Line Film Festival and this one's gonna be in Miami. And uh, we're planning, I I know, right? It's going to be probably beginning of March, end of February, beginning of March, into the spring. spring. Um, And we'll do two days of, we're probably going to choose eight movies. And then on the third day, it's going to be like a VIP um, kind of event. But I'm excited for that. That's really cool. We're going to play the greatest show on earth. Um, I'll probably have another movie out by then, but it'll also be an awards ceremony. So I'll be handing out Lionel awards to whoever I want. And um, that's just immediate. And then I'm going to be making my first feature film most likely in 2025. So 2024, I'll spend a lot of time writing and and getting all the ducks in a row but in 2025 i'll start filming my next this is going to be a feature film so it's not going to be a documentary it's going to be like real actors going to be real sets and um and that will probably come out in 2026 which is cool how old will i be i'll be uh 38 dang really I seem so far away. <laughs> it goes like this. <laughs> I know. Wow, right? amazing. Yes, and is there anything like before we conclude the, the podcast, anything you want to tell the audience, anything inspiring? Yeah. There's this clock I have behind me, which is also a stoplight, right? 
So the other day I was like, I, I know what that means. So I, th I would get this as a tattoo on me now because of how important it is. To, and here's what it means. So it's time. That's just, this is time. And this is important for you to realize, to recognize when it's time for you to slow the fuck down, <laughs> to stop. So like to relax, to get your energy back. And then also you got to realize when to slow down. If you're going too hard. You got to realize, look, man, you're human. You got a set amount of energy to exert every day. Um, you got to really be aware of your body to understand when to slow down. And also you got to know when it's time to go, when it's time to go full throttle. You got to dream or uh, aspira aspirations in your mind. You got to know when to go. So th that's also why it's important to be in touch with your body, to eat healthy, to not do drugs, to limit your drinking, if you drink, and this gets in the way, you kind of cloud your judgment. Um, and also to follow the stars to, in a way, understand your genetic makeup of your astrology and understand what's going on in the sky all the time. You don't have to be a nerd about it, but if you have Manuela in your corner, you can she can help you understand. So this is something that's important. If you can think about this stoplight, when is it time to go? When is it time to slow down? And when is the time to rest and not to confuse them? Because then that's how I kept, that's how I keep, I mean, I wasn't doing that all the time. I was just going. And then if you just keep going and going, you're going to get burned out. So that's my wisdom is that, I don't know what to call it though. The um, stoplight, stoplight of life, the stop life. I don't know. Uh, stop I'll wisdom. call it stoplight wisdom. Yeah, stoplight wisdom. Bam. Follow the stoplight. Yeah, stop follow light the stoplight. Love that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. shall we conclude our podcast? Is that okay for you, Nick? Yeah, that's great. This is fun. It's cool. So, I would like to thank Nick Alvear for joining my podcast, the Living Harmony podcast. Thank you so much, Nick, for taking your time, your precious time to come to my podcast. I Welcome. have thirty six subscribers, me. so all right, let's 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 move that upward. Let's get that to thirty six hundred. Yeah, and if you like like my YouTube, share, subscribe, give a thumbs up, and thank you so much, Nick, for being here. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for having me on. This is this is fun. I'm gonna share this on my Telegram. Yeah. So I wish you. A wonderful day. Take care and see you soon. And join me on my next podcast with some other interesting people. With that being said, love, light, and prosperity to all of you. From Manuela. Bye. Thanks.